Gemma Dale, welcome back to Property Insights. Thank you for having me. And uh, you're still uh, the director of SMSF, which uh, stands for Self-Managed Super Funds, and Investor Behaviour at NAB Trade. That's right. Yeah. First off, what's NAB Trade? Uh, so it's an online broking platform. So mm-hmm. if you like buying and selling shares like or ET- Yes. <laughs> we don't like saying that, but yes, it's yeah, a good but, description. But, but that'll do because most people sort of – yeah. or, or ComSec sort of started before you guys, I guess. Um, so, But what does investor behaviour mean? It, um, is that like data-driven stuff? It is data-driven. Uh, honestly, the most interesting thing to almost anyone I talk to, apart from what do I buy that's going to go up 50% in the next six months – is what are other people doing? What are they doing with their money? How are they investing? How are they being successful, whether it's with dividends, whether it's with growth, whether they're moving back to term deposits? People are fascinated by what other people are doing. And what other people are doing is what drives markets, right? That yeah, is t- the market. Totally. So totally. that's what I do. I talk about what other people are doing. So do you guys look at the, uh, uh, the property market as well? So is there some uh, correlation back to the property market and what investors are doing around that and our occupiers for that matter. Yeah, absolutely. So I I speak on behalf of NAB more broadly and we have big, deep economics data-driven teams who are obsessed, for want of a better term, with what's happening in property markets, right? It's absolutely critical. But even if I just look at the NAB trade database, a meaningful proportion of our population are homeowners. They are investment property owners. They are aspirational homeowners everyone has an interest in property in some point or another in their lifetime even if they've made an explicit decision not to invest in it so it comes up all the time in what we're looking at and it comes up in our data as well and, and you guys um, um alan austin does the uh, very famous uh, confidence uh, surveys mm. uh, consumer confidence surveys and business confidence surveys um where is consumer confidence i mean where where has it been going which way which direction so consumer confidence is absolutely horrendous. Like it's hard to imagine it being worse than it currently is. It is at the lowest it has ever been in the entire time frame we've been running the survey, which is decades now. And it is worse than the GFC and COVID. It is lower than that level currently. When you do your consumer, consumer confidence survey, though, do you – I mean, I, I guess the question becomes who's a consumer, but mm. are you – is it like is it a thousand, ten thousand, and are they people spread across Australia, or are they um, are they people from which socioeconomic? Are they spread across socioeconomic, very socioeconomic levels and environments? Are they homeowners, renters, people who own the home, no mortgage? I mean, what, what, how how do you build your consumer survey sample? Yeah, so d- such a good question because anyone looking at data needs to understand what the sample includes. So the objective is always to have as broad a sample as humanly possible. It needs to have more than a thousand people to be statistically significant. This is many multiples of that. And we do try really hard to ensure that we're covering all of those different demographics because there's no point only surveying baby boomers have owned a home for four decades and feel really fantastically wealthy at the moment, or only 22-year-olds who can't find a place to rent. You're going to get a really skewed data set. So it should include all of those different groups, and to the best of our knowledge, it does. And it should represent them in the same proportion that they're represented in the population. If your survey is properly representative of the market, Mm. let's just make that assumption. And I think Alan's done such a unbelievable job over so many years and everybody relies so heavily on it and including the the uh you know the the narcs and the uh, contrarians out there who uh, tend not to believe what anyone says one set of data they one finding they tend to look at or wait for is, is uh, nabs consumer confidence numbers so let's let's make the assumption that that that's clean um what is there for low confidence record low confidence sort of say to us that um, as far as a property market's concerned, what does it say to us? Does it say that we should expect a dip in property prices or does it say to us we should expect an increase in supply of property on the markets at some stage? I mean, has, has there been some correlation studies done that says if we have a three quarters or two quarters of really poor consumer confidence numbers, it's usually followed by, I don't know if this ever happened, but pro- property prices as, as an asset class to suffer? It's not particularly predictive of property prices to the best of my knowledge. We've had three 
really negative quarters and it was dipping before then. As soon as rates started to rise, it was very clear that consumer confidence was falling and then it fell absolutely off a cliff and it stayed really low and it's only ticked up in tiny increments. So it certainly hasn't kind of bounced back, even though the property market's held up remarkably well, way better than anybody expected. And the other thing that has been really challenging for us to understand is that other indicators of how the consumer is faring are not that bad. Retail sales were pretty strong. They have started to weaken recently and what we're seeing is that the economic data is weakening very rapidly now. But three to six months ago, it was looking really, really strong. The only way you could explain it was to say at a per capita level, so per person, it had fallen because we had very high immigration and that was lifting the numbers. We were just surveying more people, uh, or th- more to the point, more people were spending. More activity. More activity overall. Because, because of more people. Because of more people. So it looks better. But when you divide it by the total number of people, it was actually lower on a per person basis. But it still wasn't dramatically lower. But we're starting to see that deteriorate pretty rapidly now. So we had a bit of a flush. We had a flush. Yes. And And we're trying to understand how much of that is people accruing savings during COVID that they didn't have to spend. And they're wearing down those savings now. That's the question. Are they wearing them down or are they kind of hanging on? Well, the RBA is saying that they have... Deter- the the savings have deteriorated over the last 12 months, which sort of makes sense because a lot of people had redraw accounts, which by the way is included into the savings and, uh, and or offset accounts. And uh, because as interest rates have risen, um, those individuals can either not save as much anymore um, or alternatively have had to dip into their savings to meet their repayments, which sort of makes sense. But of course, there's no real data on that. But that sort of makes sense. That's rational to me. I, I, I would like to know, I mean, I, maybe it's never been done, but is there any, are there any correlations at all um, that come off the back of consumer confidence? So we've had three poor consumer confidence reads. Does GDP follow that? Because, you know, household consumption is a big component of GDP. Consumers are household consumers. Um, it's like somewhere between 60 and 70% of the GDP number. GDP is not looking all that flash, particularly if you do a per capita. Um, are there any correlations that uh, Alan and his team are doing that uh, maybe could be shared with us that sort of might show us what the future is looking at? Like, I know you said it's not very predictive, but in a correlation sense, it has, you know, like night follows day or day follows night, whichever way it goes. Um, what what has, have you seen in the past that follows downturns in consumer confidence? I think the things we expect to see, and you would have a high degree of confidence these would happen, we will see a fall in retail sales. Which we saw last month. And we're starting to see that come through, right? So that will start falling. We will see falls in discretionary expenditure across the board, and we should see some moderation in house price increases at the minimum unless there's this massive lift in up in immigration which is driving prices high because of more people to the point we were making earlier so they're the sorts of things we would expect to see uh, i know alan is saying very clearly they're surveying people on what they anticipate cutting back on and that's really interesting so people are saying very clearly we expect to cut back and we're going to cut back pretty hard and they are seeing cutbacks now in things like private schooling that ah. blew my mind so we're seeing that in our data that's not what people are saying that's what we're seeing in the numbers cut back on private schooling we're seeing people say they're going to cut back on travel don't know about you we know a lot of people who are traveling at the moment with the expectation traveling. yeah the expectation people are saying we're going to cut back on that so that sort of a discretionary expenditure and travel people perceive as discretionary even if it doesn't feel like it right now they're saying they will be cutting back we haven't seen the travel cut back yet but we have seen things like private school which is quite extraordinary a lot of people see that as critical expenditure right well you would expect so uh, particularly during but i think that was the case during covid but what's i i I can share with you only a little survey of a small survey but that places like byron bay ballina northern new south wales northern rivers areas have never experienced a slowdown in visitations as they are currently or have been currently experiencing since June this year. And if you look further, because normally the bookings occur now for September, for argument's sake, um, have never experienced 
such a reduction in bookings. Now that's got no relative, it's not, no, no, I'm not talking relative to the COVID period, which is around the other way. I'm talking about relative pre, to pre-COVID. Um, and, uh, and generally speaking, it's not because of prices, because prices pretty much haven't really gone up across the board, you know, like Airbnb and all that sort of stuff, the hotel prices, uh, travel costs, got cost of travel to get there has gone up, but generally speaking, it, the cost of accommodation hasn't. And it's never been the case now that, one analysis of that is because everyone, some analysis that I keep getting fed back is, oh, well, now because everyone's going overseas, everybody wants to go to Greece or Italy or wherever. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. But uh, during school holidays, um, normally you would expect a lot of bookings during the September period. Not the case uh, across the board. Like I talk to high car drivers who book out, who, who generally speaking get booked, you know, pick up someone from the airport, to take them to their accommodation place, uh, car rental companies, they you know, obviously people rent cars at airports, etc., uh, and, and the accommodation places. A lot of the places are work, walk, working on 40% uh, occupancy at the moment, which is like unheard of. Now, I don't know if everyone's discovered a new place to go to in Australia. I don't know if that's the case. Um, but, and of course, those areas up northern New South Wales uh, suffered a little bit, the Lismore floods and that stuff, but that was a, a year or two ago now. Um, it's interesting, I, my gut feeling is um, what you're saying is correct. I think people are reassessing their travel plans. I think the reason people are traveling now overseas is because they booked a year ago. Mm. Or they booked six months ago. Mm -hmm. They booked the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. um, and because they might not have gone away last year and they thought, well, shit, everyone went away, everyone had a great time, I missed out, uh, I'm gonna go. But I think also people come back and saying, my God, how much money did it cost me? Um, <laughs> yep. I can't afford to do that every year. I might do it every second or third year. Um, and I, because everyone I talk to tells me the same story. Crowded, expensive, um, ridiculously hot. <laughs> but everybody, I'm, 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 they're all saying the same thing. And, uh, and but the, the big part is the expense. And the, the, the I have shock. never had more questions about the Aussie dollar and what it's going to do. How, you, and that that lack of anticipation of how much it was going to be over there. Like I paid for my flights and I paid for my accommodation months ago, years ago. And oh, a lot of people also using up credits. Yeah, like yeah. Like pre-COVID and during yeah, yeah. COVID credits, Those, right? um, uh, yeah, yeah the, the, where, where you, you didn't go because of COVID, but they, mm -hmm. you had to cash a credit in before the end of this year, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So we're talking about... I think shifts in demand. COVID did really weird stuff where you wanted to travel overseas, but you couldn't. They brought in the home builder scheme. So you suddenly did a new kitchen with the money you would have gone overseas with. So these very strange shifts in demand, a lot of pull forward for things like home offices and furniture you needed to work from home and so on. All of that's dried up now. So a lot of the home spending that would be kind of drifting through a few years just got pulled into a 12-month period and went absolutely through the roof and then a lot of other things that we didn't spend on like travel we're doing now and it's very clear we're getting these big lumps through the data of things that would otherwise have been smoothed over a few years and immigration is a classic example right where we had no immigration for three years and then now we're getting all of it in one go and it's driving these massive distortions and it's making it quite difficult to make any meaningful predictions because you've got far more people many of them bringing a lot of capital in, even though the local population, you can see demand weakening really quickly. When do you think this, when do you think things are going to normalise? I mean, like, like, are there any predictions, like, given that immigration is going to continue to increase? Well, they, they, we've just got a lot of catch up to do. So they're talking about, I think, 1.1 million or something like that. I can't remember the number now, but like four or 500,000 already come in. That's like drinking water through a fire hose. We've probably got another year of that. When, when do you think, when do you guys, when does NAB think, well, not NAB, but like what's the view on normalisation? Like we get back to something sort of normal. So I can say on behalf of NAB, because I was talking to Alan about this really recently, so he's very concerned about the domestic economy over the next six to 12 months. Households are going to really, really struggle. Something I feel quite strongly about and it is showing up in the data really clearly is it's not all households. You've got the over 50s who've owned their own home for some time and don't have mortgages. Killing it. Killing it. Never made more money in their life. Money on deposit, killing it. Happy days, right? Life is good and they are travelling. They are paying for the private schooling. They are doing all of those things because they can afford to. The middle sector of people who own a home, particularly if they bought it recently, they're really, really stressed. Really stressed. 32 to 48. 
it's showing age. up really clearly. And then younger people, if they're renting, are doing it really tough and rent is absolutely going through the roof and there's no particularly good data to suggest that's going to moderate. So you've got two thirds of the population, although to be frank, that homeowner group is more than a third, it's bigger. And so you've got a little bit less than two thirds under a fair bit of stress. Some people got way ahead on their mortgages. That's great. But of those people, at least half, let's say, are under pressure. The next 12 months, that looks really nasty for that group. It's not pretty. And that puts pressure on businesses as well. Anyone who's exposed to that consumer group, a big chunk of the population, is going to be under pressure. But when we look at what's happening after that, the expectation is that the RBA will be forced to cut rates. Things will soften things will calm down a bit so when we talk about normalizing we're probably talking about into 2025 it's a little way away it's a good sort of 18 months before things really start to settle down but as Alan says he's very optimistic about the Australian economy in the medium term short term not great medium term much much better so if I I, I, I've read um, and Alan's probably the same era actually but Bill Evans is Westpac economic mob have sort of been at one stage it was saying mid 2024 I think they might have pushed that out a little bit now but mid 2024 seven rate reductions up to seven seven rate reduction I thought it was a little bit uh, out there but nonetheless um, what's NAB's position for when they because this is a question on everyone's lips when will rates come down and by how much um, my prognosis is sometime next year, but it's not going to be seven rate reductions. And I'd say probably Westpac would take the same view. Um, Alan, um, uh, um, Bill's retired now anyway, or now he's retirement, so um, he might change his view. But uh, actually, I think I wouldn't be surprised if Bill ends up on the Reserve Bank advisory, the new advisory board, um, because it's, it's quite unusual timing. Like he's retired from um, uh, Westpac as chief economist. He's been there for a million years. Um, and then... It would be a perfect transition for him to go over to uh, the RBA. It would be great to see Bill on the RBA, um, I think. Um, what's NAB's position in, in that regard, though? Where do you guys sort of see that the Reserve Bank will start to, you know, help us out a bit? So we're looking probably 12 months from now, second half of 2024, and we're predicting three cuts. That sounds more rational to me. But yeah, yeah, back into the sort of 3% range, three, three and a half not two right and not sub two and no. i think that's the one thing it's been such an extraordinary time right to see rates cut to point one of a percent i never imagined i'd see it in my lifetime and i'm relatively young you know we've got economists who are retiring now who never thought they'd see it in i've never lifetime. seen it and i'm not young so I, i've definitely never seen we that we can rate. go back millennia and we've never seen point one of a percent right we never anticipated that would happen the idea that they would stay at that level to 2024 was ridiculous and should never have been put in the public domain to be frank and to see rates increase was not surprising. But then 4.1 was a big shock. Our guys were saying that normal rates were two. That was only 12 months ago. So things have turned around really, really quickly. No one's done a fabulous job of getting it right, least of all the people who are actually setting the rates in the first place. So I don't think that that's a particularly unrealistic prediction. So 3% official cash rate. Somewhere between three and three and a half. Three and three and a half. Yeah, okay. not necessarily down to three. That'd be a lot of cuts. That'd be the seven cuts that we were talking about. Yeah. We're probably three cuts and so probably closer to three and a half in the second half of 2024. Which means expect to see mortgage rates around uh, topping out at five plus, sort of that territory, that the retail rate. So, which is sort of okay because that makes, that makes, that makes sense to me because... If you want to make sure we don't have a disaster, for those people we assessed at two percent with a three percent buffer, we assessed them at five percent, fixed and variable, because the variable rate is like two point one or two point two at the time. So we want those people to be properly have been properly assessed, and in today's in in terms of their today's income or their t- today's revenue or wages or whatever the, the case may be, which we assessed against a couple of years ago, we don't want them to be under pressure. And we, because we don't want a problem for the mortgage market or the property market. When I say we, Australia doesn't want that. So that makes sense, uh, three and a half, um, you know, because it means their retail rate's going to be close to five, you know, around, around about where they were assessed some time ago. 
So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I think, and you're saying a year that you're sort of saying August, September, whatever, October the next year, not gonna hold you to 12 months, but around that territory. Because basically what we're saying now is, if you're a borrower and you're under a bit of pressure, you have gotta put yourself in a position to hang out there for 12 months from now. If that means getting another job, uh, getting an ex doing more hours, uh, cutting costs, selling an asset, whatever the case may be, because don't, we don't want you to panic and say, oh my God, I, I, this is gonna be the way it is forever. Because just like inter low interest rates were never gonna last forever, these high interest rates aren't gonna last forever because they're, they're, this is an extraordinarily high rate environment relative to where normalization would be. And, uh, and who knows, it could be 12 months, 14 months, whatever. But that's interesting that NAB's taking a similar view. I, I'd, I haven't seen what CBA have said. Uh, oh, they were talking a little while ago about this. Uh, it, it, there would seem to be an accord between the major banks. I haven't heard much from ANZ at all, but the CBA does talk a bit. Westpac obviously through Bill does. NAB does. Um, you guys talk quite a bit about this stuff. You don't hear much from ANZ, but it would seem to be that there's an accord between the three of the majors and uh, you're all around the same territory. You might not be saying the same amount of rate reductions, but you are saying rate reductions sometime mid to late next year. Is that where you say the prognosis is? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, rates have been rising so aggressively for a very real reason, which is inflation was out of control. And then everyone's starting to see it moderate. The difficult part is that the things that are rising are the ones that make us nervous. Rents are rising still. Uh, services inflation is still fairly hot, even though goods inflation is falling. So have they done the job on inflation? It's hard to say, but it will be done at some point. The consumer is clearly weakening now, and we see that starting to accelerate things, starting to deteriorate for consumers. And at that point, the RBA starts getting nervous they've overcooked it happens in every single cycle and so we anticipate that they will take take their foot off the pedal but probably not till next year because you want to make sure the job is done you don't want inflation to take off again that's the last thing they want to see and ironically one of the things they would hate to see is the property market take off again yeah if we start seeing 10 percent increases in property prices you can be guaranteed they will not be cutting rates that is not in anyone's best interest so what we hope though Gemma, is that uh, they don't hold out too long because you know it's one thing to make we want consumers to start to stop doing what they were doing that is putting allowing vendors to put their price up because by 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 because of the demand but what we don't want is consumers to start to buckle oh no we don't want to collapse nobody yeah. wants that because it's worse. very hard to reinflate the economy when there's been a complete collapse it's yeah. very very difficult and can obviously take quite a long time look at china so it's that real tension between keeping rates at a level that demand is not exploding, particularly when you've got very high immigration, but also not breaking the consumer. And the real difficulty we've got is the one we've talked about where you've got massive generational differences in terms of who is still spending, because we know the over 50s are still spending, and young people breaking. Well, that's your workforce. How do you we get the over 50s work. to pull ahead in a bit? I mean, what's the deal there? I mean, Go home I mean, and have a chat with your parents? Yeah. <laughs> well, my parents are definitely over 50. Um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but funny thing is, my dad, who's 90, he is, he's not overspending, because he's, he's got brought up in a, a frugal environment, and you never overspend, ever, mm. good or bad, irrespective. Yep. Um, uh, how do we get the over 50s who don't think that way, I mean, to stop, just to pull their head in a little bit because their spending is affecting the lives of everyone who's at a lower age. Their, their spending is affecting those people in their 20s or 30s. Now, it's not, I'm not saying they shouldn't spend, but just they need to know their grandkids or their kids are being affected. Yeah, it's a real challenge. And I don't think it's one we've faced in a material sense in previous tightening cycles. You know, in the 90s, in the early 90s, when rates were going through the roof, late 80s, early 90s, most people were homeowners with a mortgage. That was the largest proportion of the population. Now they're not. They're, you know, down to that third we were talking about. And because you've got this massive cohort of baby boomers who are very secure financially, asking them to change their behaviour for a different group of the population is a real challenge. The one thing that absolutely could happen is moderating rents. Uh, if you are a property investor, rents are driving up inflation almost more than anything else at this point in time as the goods inflation is softening. So that's the kind of stuff that absolutely- Because yeah, rent's going to services. 
goes into services, absolutely. And they're a huge chunk. Yeah, huge well, chunk. they got heavy weighting because there's so many people. They weighted up. They, they, they weighted quite heavily because there's a big percentage of the population. They, they weighted by a number yes. of users. Ironically, it's way less of a weight than it is in your personal expenditure, though, right? If you're a renter, it's not 7% of your income. It's no, no. quite a bit more than that. So it feels like a huge weight when you look at the way CPI is constructed. But if you look at your personal expenditure, it's not a direct correlation at all. Yeah, it could different. be weighted even more heavily. Yeah, oh, if absolutely. If that was the case. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I've, I mean, everyone talks about, you know, interest rates or, or monetary policy being a blind in, in, instrument. I don't think it's been any period in my time that has been more demonstrated how inefficient um, in terms of fairness, fairness efficiency, that um, interest rates have, has become because it is spilled over into every market and the people who are being affected the most are the people who can't afford it the most. And they're probably the people who don't, they are probably the people who were spending the least amount because in terms of percentage of their total income on goods and services, they're probably the people who led the most frugal lives, um, unfortunately. But that's that's all we got to deal with. I mean, we I don't know what else we could put in, maybe some fiscal policy, but I, I don't know what else we can deal with. Um, and what, one of the things that's really interesting for me, Gemma, is this um, the whole point about, uh, you know, Governments love talking about this, but oh wow, you know, like we uh, banked forty billion or whatever it was most recently, and you know our GDP is still going pretty well. But if you do everything on a per capita basis, we're not doing that well, given the numbers of people, the increase in numbers of people on a per capita basis, we don't look that great. It's also our GDP is so skewed by the fact that we do a lot of mining. Our exports are primarily sent offshore uh, and processed somewhere else. So <laughs> GDP is a really poor measure. In Australia, anyway. Yeah, because the prosperity dividend for mining, mining doesn't get in, come into my hands or your hands or you know Jono's hands over there producing mm. the show. I mean, he he can't say, "Wow, how good <laughs> is it?" You know, if, uh, you know, know Twiggy Forest fantastic. made a fortune. Yeah, um, I'm I'm feeling so much better because my bank account's swollen mm -hmm. um, because it, he's got nothing from it. Um, that's sort of a, a nearly a flaw in the GDP formula, um, the, which they you know the expenditure method which they use, which is exports minus imports, which is. Yeah. And also that uh, mining, the in mining investment piece as part of the total investment, a business investment piece, um, is also can put things out of whack. But by the way, that helped us during um, uh, the uh, uh, GFC because it looked like we were doing better than everyone else in the world, only because our mining companies were expanding their ports and everything. Um, so sometimes it helps us, sometimes it's hurt, it hurts us. But I guess what you're saying here is... Um, don't be too caught up about how good we're going. Um, maybe read NAB's Consumer Confidence Surveys. <laughs> Don't read that. You'll get really depressed. And, and, <laughs> it's and, terrible. And measure everything up. It's, uh, well, interestingly enough, if you do want to read something, read the business survey. Yeah, well, that and says pretty good. business conditions. Yeah. Because business confidence is rubbish, but business conditions are actually still pretty good. Yeah, they're good. And so if you if you steer away from the confidence side and focus on the actual conditions, they seem to be okay. And that's the reason that our guys are fairly confident in the medium term. We'll that's be, why they're optimistic. That will be okay. That will be okay. Yeah, so bottom line is, story out of this is, there's something good going to come our way, a bit of relief. Hang in there until that comes. This is not going to last forever. Um, and if you can hang in there, everything should be fine. Protect your job. Do everything you need to do to make sure your income is protected. Just curb your costs, your spending, and everything will be okay eventually because Australia is just a great place to live and we're just so bloody lucky that we've got so many resources and everything else. I mean, that's, that is the case. Look, the lovely thing about our resources is even as we wean ourselves off coal and so on, we have all the great stuff everyone wants for renewables. So we do have a lot going for us in so many ways. It, uh, it just feels a bit tight for a lot of people at the moment. Gemma Dale. Um, by the way, listen to Gemma's podcast called Your Wealth Podcast. Um, Gemma Dale, thanks very much. Good to see you again. Thank you for having me.